This week on Motor Week, Chris Goffey visits the AC factory and gets a world exclusive drive of the Aseka. Richard Hammond goes mental in a Suzuki Wagon R and Ken Gibson drives the Ford Focus Saloon. Here at the Weybridge factory, they're still building around 15 super blowers a year by the time-honored craftsmanship, hand assembly, and hand building methods. But at AC, the emphasis has switched very much to the new car, the Ace, the car that broke the company. It's a lovely looking car, it reminds me a bit of the AC427 Frau convertible from the 60s. All the extras you'd expect for a car in this price range feels well screwed together too, and it is enough go. Now can't you just imagine yourself cruising down the seafronts at Nice in this car? It's exactly the right image, it's the right sort of weather, just take me to the ferry. Mind you, this is no boulevard cruiser. This car is fitted with the super blower engine we saw in the Cobra. You can have it in unsupercharged 5 litre form, or you can have it in 4.6 quad cam, the smoothest V8 around, which is designed for the new Mustang. And if you want to use it, the performance is there. 0 to 60 again, round about five seconds, maximum speed governed to 155 miles an hour. Back in the 1950s, when most cars on Britain's roads were of the Ford Pop or Morris Minor level of performance, AC Cars, one of Britain's oldest car manufacturers, came out with a jaw-droppingly beautiful sports car called the Ace, capable of 100 miles an hour. Now, the story of how Carroll Shelby subsequently shoehorned a fire-breathing Ford V8 into the chassis and created the brutal Cobra is the stuff of motoring legend. It's pretty much the mixture as before. Oh, I'm getting old. Take a big Ford V8, in this case the 5 litre supercharged 320 brake horsepower unit slotted into the same old body and chassis, make it meet uh, modern emission, noise and safety regulations, slap on a price tag of £70,000 and Bob's your uncle. But of course there's far more to it than that. They've spent a great deal of time and money refining the car over the original Cobra. The first 289s and 427s were real animals. You were driving them was like playing Russian roulette. You never knew when the bomb was going to go off. And if the Cobra did bite you, you knew it was going to be fatal. But that old Cobra trademark is still here in the super blower. And that's performance. 0 to 60 around 5 seconds and maximum speed. Well, when does your wig blow off and your false teeth fall out? It's still the best adrenaline pump that man has yet invented. Trouble with the AC original for me is the number of replicas on the market. Now, when any Tom, Dick or Harry can build a Sierra-based replica of this car for 12,000 quid, then spending 70,000 on the original starts to lose a bit of the charisma. Now we promised you an exclusive treat, and here it is. The AC Aseka, the second of the pillars upon which the future wealth and prosperity of AC cars will be based. It's the front end of the Ace, the wheelbase is lengthened by 240 millimeters, and designed by Ron Saunders, their chief designer, it's a coupe with aluminium body and a full four-seater capacity. We first saw it at the motor show last year, that car was a non-runner. They've been working on it here at Byfleet, and now it definitely does run. 
and we're going to be the first British team allowed to drive it. Now this after all is an engineering prototype so one respects the factory we're not going to go for ultimate performance figures but uh, with a 4 cam V8 developing 320 brake uh, AC estimate the 0 to 60 in around uh, five and a half seconds and a governed maximum of around 155 miles an hour it's the sort of car that's uh, designed for cruising across continents beautifully trimmed inside as you'd expect lovely leather work uh, nice walnut good instrument display and uh, all done in-house by AC themselves which is quite surprising in these days when most components are bought out. A few shakes and rattles in this car but as I say you'd expect it in a prototype and very good room for your mates in the back. It's difficult to form complete road impressions on such a short acquaintance but very light steering it feels extremely sure-footed with this width of rubber on the road nicely weighted steering although at uh, full lot with some tyre scrub that indicates they've got a bit of work to do on their steering geometry next. Borg Warner T45 gearbox with short throw but they anticipate that when they get into production automatics will be the preferred option and in the crowded traffic conditions of uh, Weybridge it doesn't overheat doesn't fart and bang like a performance car it's starting to show its true colors as a quiet dignified gentleman's high-speed carriage at the back under the smooth lines a tailgate lifts to reveal substantial luggage accommodation there really is room for your golf clubs in here and on the production versions the seats will fold forward for more luggage capacity again everything beautifully trimmed in suede and carpet this is still very much a prototype the tailgate will probably be a bit wider in production cars lovely shape it reminds me of early Bristol 400s uh, aerodynamic contours and no bad thing for that AC say the car will sell for £70,000 when it's launched. They're already working on car number two and get your name down on the list because they're only going to build initially about one a week. You always feel sorry for tiny little independent companies like this fighting for survival in a world dominated by the industry big boys. On the basis of our visit to Weybridge, the air of cheerful optimism is infectious. And if effort and commitment count for anything, they do deserve to succeed. Let's hope there's enough people out there ready to lay out their cash in a very good cause. The Suzuki Wagon R. It's a quirky little city car. It's a tiny little people carrier for presumably carrying, well, tiny little people. And they'd have to be shaped rather like that to fit into its rather square shape. I've looked at this car before, and when I did so, I criticised it for perhaps not going round corners particularly well. But that's really not particularly fair. It's very tall and very narrow, and you can't really criticise it for something that clearly it's never going to be very good at. So we thought we'd see how the thing does in a straight line. And that's why we've brought it here. To Santa Pod, where straight lines are very much de rigueur. So before we do anything silly out there, let's take a quick recap of what we've got here. This in fact is the Wagon R Plus. It's a slightly broader and bigger derivative of the original Wagon R. And the shades, well they're for this. The interior. Be ready. Don't blame me, okay? Ooh, it looks like something Heidi stitched in the 60s. Definitely not the kind of thing you want to encounter with a hangover, but then this isn't ever going to be bought by the kind of people who know what a hangover is. But I suspect it's fairly durable. But here's an oddity. Considering the Japanese are such a small little people, and I can empathise with that, I don't understand this, right? In a nice small interior, why do we have... What, all this head, what's going on with that then? What's the, what, it's not necessary, is it? Clearly, I don't need that. Being fair though, in what is after all a very small vehicle, there's quite a lot of room. If we get into the back, you're sat slightly higher up than in the front, which gives it that nice, uh, nice powerful feeling. As you can tell, it's quite stylish. I'm, I'm sure I look quite good here, I'll look like this sort of thing. I think it's got a, you know, 
It's... Oof. We're standing in front of Alan's monstrous Capri. This thing really is a beast of a thing. This isn't the first year for this car though, is it? No, last year I actually raced it in Sportsman ET and that was my first season. After that I thought I needed to step up a bit so hopefully we're moving up into Pro ET this year and uh, we're trying it out today and see what it will do. Well we've got your team fettling it at the other end, working away on it. Yeah. Uh, what have you actually done in the development? Because I know your father's here and secretly he told me you've been working 14, 15, 20 hours a day on this. Yeah. haven't been on holiday, this is all you've done. What have you done? Well last year it was actually a road car and I decided to make the move from a road car into a full race car. We had to change the axle in it, put slicks on the back end, and so and lighten the car up as much as we can. So, so you spent all of your money, most of your time, That's right. and how much faster? What are you actually going to gain? Well, hopefully, just over a second from last year. A second? Yeah. It's a lot of work for a second. Though. Yeah, but that's drag race. Why would you do it? Oh, because I want to go quicker. And the, the harder the buzz, the harder the pull, and the, the more you enjoy it. Well, there's no arguing with that. Look, I'm going to have a go later on. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'll see you on the track, mate. Okay, and anything okay. can happen. I've got to say, you're in, in like some sort of semblance of. I'm wearing flame retardant corduroy. Yeah, that's, that that's a, good. Is that all right? Do, yeah, I, do, do you guys wear a special kit? Well, we've got um, no mix underwear. Right. With, uh, just a flame retardant. So it's like your wear. fireproof pants? Yeah, yeah, it's just regulations. Well, I don't mind, are, but. Yeah, right. And, uh, so I've got neck brace as well, which I'll have to wear for racing and stuff. Right, neck brace. Helmet. Okay, I've got a fairly stiff collar on this shirt, actually, yeah. so I think I'm probably all right. Look, all the best out there. And uh, I'll see you on the track. Okay then. All right then. Like to see it. We're gonna do it. Oh really? Just because your wheels are bigger at the back than at the front? It didn't even do a burnout. Amateurs, I did. My wheels are hot. These tyres are just... Go, green, go! Come on, baby! <laughs> oh, we got a second. Come on, come on, come on, come on! We're going to get him. We're gonna, I'm going to do this. I'm going to win. I'm gonna, we've got four. We've got a gear left. We're doing 45. Come on! <laughs> Call that a car. Hasn't even done a burnout. Amateur. Don't know what he's doing. Yeah, and close your window as well. Rules of the road. These are the basics. People need to know this. Amateurs. Oh, hang on, we're going. Go! Come on, baby. You can do it. Just. Yes! Whoa! 30. Ah! Well, I've got two more gears yet. Are we gonna. We really are. Hmm. But a surprising amount of space really in this fairly small but pretty flexible interior. This is definitely a lifestyle vehicle. Only thing is, perhaps not this particular lifestyle. After the break, Ken Gibson drives to Ford Focus Saloon and poses the question, how much better than the Escort is it really? Call me Mr. Lucky, because the other day I got an invitation from Citroen and they said, Howard, how would you like to come along and drive one of our vans? Vans, I said, I don't drive vans. But the more they talked about it, the more I liked the sound of it. And you might like the sound of it too. Listen to this. Off we go. This is the Citroen Berlingo Electrique. The Berlingo Electrique has a range of about 50, 60 miles before you need to plug it in and recharge it. And it's lovely to drive. It really has got a bit of poke about it. 
Now that's what I call silent running. It really is great fun to drive. And because it's electric, look at this. It's just as quick in reverse. The Citroen Berlingo Electrique is powered by four battery packs. One of them is to be found under the bonnet and the other three under the floor and it runs off 150 volts DC. But why does an electric car have a petrol tank? Actually it's got to be one of the smallest tanks around, it only takes five litres and it's used to power the heating system inside the car. Otherwise, all you have to do is plug it into a domestic power supply and it costs just a pound to charge the whole thing up. The bad news is it takes 10 hours. This is the Ford Escort, Britain's favourite family car. We bought a staggering 4.46 million of them. This car has been in the sales charts for about as long as Cliff Richard has been in the pop charts but the Escort is getting a little old. It's getting a little outdated. And this is going to be the future. This is the Ford Focus. And today we've got a TV world exclusive first drive of the saloon model. So here we are inside the Focus and the first thing it strikes you is it's as boldly impressive inside as it is out. It's got curves everywhere, it's very eye-catching, but it's practical. Radio for example, easily to hand, perfect for placement. All the other dials as well have all been put very close to your hands. They're easy to reach, they're easy to touch, and they've got a quality feel to them. One thing I don't like is this wood around here. It spoils the rest of the car. Even in gear form where we've got leather, it's tacky and it's obviously fake. It's got lots of handy things. The information, press this here, comes up on the screen in front of you. You get everything from mileage to the temperature. Wing mirrors, you can adjust them here as well. They're very easy to touch. And there's an awful lot of room in this car. If you look in the back, there's plenty of space. The other thing is driving position. Perfect driving position. You sit up well, everything's to hand. Get the focus out on the open road and you definitely start to get shades of Colin McRae. This handles like an absolute dream. It corners superbly. I've never been in a saloon car that hugs the road just as well as this car does. The brakes are very positive. The steering is remarkably precise. You just touch the wheel either way there and you get instant feedback. And the road comfort is very good. Uh, passengers that I've had in have been very comfortable as well. It's a car that you can enjoy driving around town or doing long journeys on a motorway. Performance is, um, that's a strange one. I'm driving the uh, two litre version here and it's got plenty of pep. It's not too thrashy when you push it. And, and the performance is reasonable. I have to say I prefer the 1.6. It's quieter, smoother, and the difference in power, there's not a great deal. So this is our Ford Escort current owner, Mark Stevens. Let's see what he thinks of the car. Compared with the Escort, the driving seat feels a little bit higher. You feel more controlled over the road. You feel like you're in control. The steering wheel is nice and high up. On entry to the car, get your knees under there a lot easier. It makes it a lot easier to get in and out. I think the dashboard's a lot better. You've got everything's turned around slightly to face towards you. So a quick glimpse, you can see everything. Everything's there within reach of the hand. You've got nothing like in the Escort. You've got the ashtray right down by the gear stick. Now, if you've got the gear box, gear third gear and it makes it a little bit difficult to get the ashtray fully out. I find the gears are a lot, lot smoother. In the Escort you find the gears are a little bit notchy, but here they're nice and smooth, they're just slipping nicely. The clutch seems nice and light, nice and easy, easy 
to use. Handling wise, the steering wheel seems, steering seems uh, a lot more controllable than the Escort. There's not too much difference between the performance in this and the Escort. If anything, say the focus is a little bit better, but you can't, it's hard to tell. So, what's the verdict on the Ford Focus? Well, quite simply, Ford have absolutely rewritten the rule books for small family cars. This is a class act. It will be without doubt the best selling car in Britain this year. And perhaps the best compliment I can pay to it, it's gonna be a worthy replacement to the Escort. Motorweek News. Lotus has been awarded the Sir Henry Royce Memorial Foundation Award for engineering excellence for the design and development of the Elise. With recent improvements, including new rear tyres and brake specifications brought into the range with the launch of the 111s, the Elise has maintained its role as a benchmark for ride and handling. Data gathered by ABS, the Vehicle Inspection and Valuation Specialist, indicated that 25% of the used cars they inspected in the first quarter of 99 had been clocked, an increase of 4% over the same period last year. In Southeast Britain, the reported figure was as high as 30%. These are disturbing figures and should go as a warning to potential buyers. The switch to twice yearly number plate changes has provided a predictable sales boost in March. Registrations were up 73% on last year's at 370,000, according to figures from the SMMT. Ford have been rewarded for making such a radical replacement for the Escort. The Focus topped the sales charts, with 20,205 units being sold so far. In fact, the Focus has recorded the best ever first six-month sales figure for a small family car. Next week, MotorWeek takes a close look at the growing popularity for importing cars from Europe, Japan and America. Can you really save money or is it too much bother?